to the cloud. All right, welcome to the uh, January New England Herpetological Society meeting. Uh, we're very happy to have uh, our current participants as well as anyone who's going to view this video later. Today, uh, Tigrin is going to be presenting. Uh, the title of it is uh, Snakes and Us, and he's going to explain what that means. We're going to see a lot of really nice critters. Um, Hopefully our next meeting will be in person, but we're doing the best we can here. And uh, I think Tigran, you can uh, take it away. Uh, we will have questions after. Alrighty. Thank you everyone for coming today and joining us in this uh, New England Herpetological Society uh, Zoom meeting. So my name is Tigran Tadevusian. I'm a herpetologist, conservation biologist, and veterinarian. Uh, I am native, well, I'm originally from Armenia. That's, that's where my accent from. And I will start this uh, presentation from telling a little bit about myself. So I was born in 1976 and as far as I remember from maybe age of four, I was interested in maybe different critters, you know, I would go and you know, catch snails, different bugs. And every time when we would go for a walk with my father, I would just stop him to take a look at something to leave uh, alive. And, uh, as far as I recall, at around that age, I actually, uh, I haven't seen snakes in uh, yet, but I was exposed to some tales about them, uh, both in written and media, which means cartoons and movies formats. And I recall myself being really uh, scared for instance, my grandmother was reading me a book which was called Ripped Ear, and it was written by, by Russian, uh, actually, writer Vitaly Bianchi, who was by himself a naturalist and a hunter, and he would write many different stories. So this one was a little bit, just a little book by itself, and the story was just about a mother rabbit which had to protect her cute babies from this big black snake. And of course, the story was mostly on the rabbit size, side. And uh, what was interesting that sometimes I would just open that page where the snake was pictured and I would feel that my, you know, I would get like goosebumps and my hair would stand. So I certainly had quite a bit of uh, adrenaline. Uh, getting out there in my body. What was that? Well, the big theory about this uh, is, you know, we humans, we are like primates. Uh, we usually copy what we see in others, and it kind of helps us to, you know, very often avoid mistakes and be probably, you know, uh, adequate members of society by copying, we learn a lot. And we don't just copy actions that maybe not so much actions, but we copy attitudes. And we also copy and learn a variety of information. And what we get, that's what we learn. Uh, some things are pretty useful. But I would like to actually, uh, before going to the showroom, uh, just uh, show you a couple of motives, just, just to make it a little bit, it's, it's gonna be a slideshow and I will, I will talk as this slideshow goes on, okay? So let me begin my screen sharing over here. 
share screen. Oh, I think you may have disabled screen sharing for me, uh, Kim. Anyhow, uh, so the long story short, many media, many movies, and many cartoons, many books, starting with such an old book like Bible, they basically tell you the following primary messages. Bibles tell you, Bible tells you that snakes are not to be trusted. And back then, 2000 years ago, when only a handful of people could read, uh, no one could write with some exceptions of people in power. Uh, it was written that they were cursed. And uh, over 2000 years, specifically Christians, but Many Adrian. other people living in Middle East. Yeah, I got it. Mid you can uh, screen share now. Sorry okay, about thanks. that. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, many other people uh, living in Middle East. And that's where kind of civilizations started uh, at the beginning. And that's what the area about which we know a lot. Uh, they basically, you know, had this almost cult. You know, they understood that they need to be careful with snakes. At least they knew that snakes may be deadly, at least in some situations. Uh, probably most of them couldn't recognize different species. And they are kind of cultivated media, which would from very early age teach people that, you know, snakes aren't to be trusted, they are to be avoided, at the very least in a Bible's narrative that they were cursed. Uh, and that narrative kept developing into a variety of folk stories as well as written stories, many of which reached our time. So if you think about such a famous stories as like Kipling's uh, Jungle Book, the story about Riki Tsikitabi, or if you recall, you know, any, you know, movies, uh, which are just terrifying overall. Uh, many of these materials, they actually make us, cartoons, kids, movies, adults, experience fear. And when fear is experienced, we, we are kind of, we cannot judge. We get into this defense mode. And we cannot learn. And as a result, we, we have pretty large population of people who are not necessarily uh, are appreciating snakes. I need to admit, though, that I am quite impressed by this contemporary last few generations, which are seem to be breaking this uh, habit, especially in developed world, uh, like in Europe, in US, and even in a country where I came from in Armenia, these patterns gradually change. But it's a minority of people who actually can sympathize to snakes. Uh, all right, so I uh, basically I established this little room called Snake Conservation and Applied Research Facility in 2019. And I do research on snakes, I study snakes, I do environmental consulting, that's how I make for a living. And I always was fascinated how little there is known about snakes in the broad public. I also uh, has been fascinated how hard it is to get any funding for you know, studying snakes. Like one movie to scare a lot of people from snakes can have 33 million, 35 million budget. And many conservation projects, they can get, you know, few tens, maybe hundred, maybe half a million dollars at the best, but not even often. So my, my far reaching goal is to actually educate people about what snakes are and what snakes are not. And 
make people to be more aware of what it is. And this is what uh, the show will be about. So you can, you can switch on my uh, camera, please. Kim. Awesome. So I'll be working with this thing, and I know that quality is not going to be all the time same, but I'll start with saying that, do you see this graph? Is it clearly visible? So I'll start from saying that there are over 4,000 people, uh, species of snakes extend on our planet. And they are very different. And they form several major groups. You may be aware of some of them, such as, you know, boys, these are, you know, all sort of boas. Uh, there are, it's, it's pretty primitive group. Pythons with lots of samus, which are also very primitive, we call them prime snakes or henopedia. Uh, there are even more primitive scolecopedians, different blind snakes, primarily from tropics. And there are finally some advanced snakes, which include acrophorgas, which are fire snakes, and colibroidea, which are basically, these include all most well-known uh, temperate snakes, including colubrids, matricins, uh, parlactins, uh, elephants, which are venomous, all of them, as well as like carrots, including our pea fiber of Americas and Asia. Um, so I kind of my I organize my room a little bit in this systematic order, and probably you know I would start with one of the most primitive of my species. Uh, you can see I keep them in different kind of containers. Some of them are in bioactive setups, other in simpler tanks, and some are just in two boxes like this. So if you see a snake, so this is actually very primitive uh, snake called Mexican borrowing python. I acquired this very recently and it is in shed now. That's why it's a kind of bluish. Uh, it has very small eyes. It all can be visible. Uh, very tiny eyes. As all pythons, it has this narrow, belly skews. It's unknown whether they have, you know, thermal receptors like pythons do or not. We know they lay eggs. And what is interesting, it's not a true python, it's actually a, you know, even more ancient group, which probably got formed and actually penetrated to Americas even before Africa and Southern America got separated. And there is only one species living from Latin America to northern portion of South America. And this is it. Uh, now let's go a little bit up, take a look on another species of actual a boar. Actually, let's take a look at this one first. This is probably most famous out of them. Many hobbyists have them. This is boa constrictor. And this species is spread again from Central, uh, from Central America to South America, it forms a number of uh, different species. Um, this specifically is Colombian, uh, 
common law, also called right or threat hell law. This is actually, in my opinion, one of the most beautiful snakes. And I'll actually ask it to make a little sound for us over here. So in general, what's going on with snakes? Uh, so many of them are not really that dangerous. And you can get pretty close to them as I am now. This one, of course, is pretty tame. But what I'm going to do, even with this tank snakes, I'm just going to stop talking right now, but tap its back. Tapping snakes back is a kind of uh, one of the pretty offensive things you can do to them to make them nervous. Just touching their back, especially with bare hands, which are kind of hot. So let's see if she will make any sounds for me. You hear that? Yeah, she made she made a little very short pieces. All right, let's take a look at another boa. So this species is actually it's it's living on the ground, so it's kind of ground dwelling mostly snakes. Sometimes it can climb trees, and as ground dwelling snakes, it has it's heavy snake. It, it has this coloration which would make it almost invisible on on a leafy background. Now let's take a look at the arboreal species of boa. So this one is called garden tree boa or Amazon tree boa. And it lives in, again, southern portion of Central America, and primarily Southern America. And these guys, they live in caves and on trees. And you see how it's coiled? I'll try to take her out and see how she'll behave. Actually, I do have another Amazon tree boa in this bioactive setup. This is more interesting setup of living plants, and I usually change this pretty rarely. But what I'm going to do now, I'm going to take this boa out and we'll bring it in front of computers. So Kim, if you could please turn my computer on. While you're doing that, I'll bring the ball. So to handle the snakes, I actually put gloves on. The issue with boas and pythons, as I mentioned, they have this what called heat sensing organs. And in arboreal species, which are you know evolved to hunt things like birds and bats, they need to be really reactive in order to actually be successful in hunting. So what I'm going to do now, see, I'm gonna, you see that? I'm gonna move my bare hand in front of her. And now she sees my heat signature and she reacts on it. I don't know how well it is visible. Now she's staring at my face. Here you go. So now let's, let's try it a different way. As you see, she doesn't attack my hand, which I'm holding her with. And I'm gonna do another thing. I'm just gonna bring this hat. Oops, <laughs> she already got a little bit annoyed, but I'm gonna bring this hand with the glove close to her face. And you will see that now she's not really as reactive towards it, you know, because she does not see my it's a Signature. This is what happens over here. Again, these are nocturnal snakes. They're active at night. And oh, this is more like, you know, she's already a little bit worked up. But 
uh, they react a lot using heat sensing. Now, you probably heard that snakes also use sense of smell intensively, and you can see her actually flickering her tongue all the time. Well, that's how she collects this, uh, you know, information about smell and taste of the environment, but actual, uh, all right. Actual range of detection of the smell organs are much shorter compared with heat and vision. So, all right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna put her back, not to harass her any longer. And I'll see if I can bring anything else to you. So, the next thing I'm going to pick up will be a very unique representative of very different global snakes. And these are called file snakes. These guys, they form their unique family. Acrocordidae. Uh, indeed, where I, where I was going to school, we only heard about few families because back then people didn't know much about uh, genetical differences, which we do know now. But this is actually a completely aquatic snake, which often even goes in open ocean. And these guys are known from India, into China to Australia. This specific one is from Java, and they are specialized to actually eat fish and some crustaceans. You can see they have a very long forked tongue, actually very deeply forked tongue, very tiny eyes, and they don't basically have any differentiated ventral skews. Their belly covered almost by similar kind of scales as their back. And the reason these snakes are called file snakes is because they feel almost like sandpaper. And they have very unique way of actually hunting uh, fish. You know, fish is slippery, not easy to catch. And in, you know, especially tidal environments where these guys live, uh, it may not be easy to actually make a straight movement through the current and grab what you need. So they use pretty interesting strategy. These guys actually go and get into fishy area where there, where there are few fish, uh, maybe sometimes small groups, and they let themselves just to kind of fall down on those fish. And when they fill them with their body, they just constrict around it and just secure it with their body before grabbing it with their mouth. And they typically, you know, uh, some snakes are very slow in swallowing, but in these guys, it takes just, just about 30 seconds to swallow a fish very fast. So I'm gonna put her back and not harass her any longer. Uh, and before I show you the tail as well, it's almost, you know, it's very flat tail, somewhat like eel tail. Looks less, nothing like a snake. And this is very also old and primitive colubrid. Uh, there are only three or four species of uh, file snakes are there left on earth. And all of them occur in the area of uh, Australasia. And probably the best known of them is actually the elephant trunk snake, which is completely freshwater. And this one is called little file snakes so that lives in tide waters as well as goes pretty deep in oceans. They are completely harmless, never even bite.
So let's go and see who else we've got. So here we have two, actually three New England colubrids. Uh, these are mostly harmless snakes, but uh, so in this tank I actually have a uh, ribbon snakes. Oh, there is one. You see its head sticking out. It's a small and fast moving snake, a very fragile. You see how big eyes they have? I don't know if it's well visible or not. I'll try to show you. Okay. So this is a ribbon snake. It looks almost like garter snake, but it's much thinner and has very long tail, which garter snakes don't. Garter snakes are more like a little bit more stouted snakes. And these guys often climb bushes and garter snakes are, uh, tend to spend most of their time just in a leaf litter and on a surface. Now, if you can see, uh, what is common between these, they, they, with garter snakes, they form the same genus, Samnophis, but they also are members of the same subfamily, Natricidae, uh, which includes all sorts of water snakes from different continents. And they have been proven to be a little bit different from Calubroid snakes. Indeed, many of these snakes may actually possess toxins in their saliva, or even having large teeth, as some do. And some natricins, they actually tend to uh, accumulate toxins from their prey, meaning toads and frogs. But yeah, garter snakes are, are beautiful. They're perfect terrarium animals, actually. Uh, very lively. <laughs> okay, I'm not going to harass this any longer. I'm going to put it back. Um, Kim, may I ask you to switch to the camera, uh, to the phone? So in this area, you have a garter snake. Remember I just told you, this is another New England native uh, natural snake. And you can see right now it's hiding. Okay, so this one is actually trying to escape, and that's so this is what they usually do, just cover the musk. This is actually pretty specific, uh, characteristic of these different matrices uh, and other amphibian eating snakes. We don't want to quickly put this thing back, which is very long back. But as you can see, it looks a little bit similar to ribbon snake, but it's it's much more stouted and powerful bigger snake. The next New England snake that I want to show you is actually Northern Black Tracer. That's another species from my collection. Now, similar to those two matrices I showed you. You can see that this probably will have pretty large eyes. I don't, can you see the eyes? 
Um, now, these snakes are visual. They do not have that key perception, or at least not to the degree that, you know, boys and pythons as well as uh, different vipers, primarily pig vipers, have. They orient using their vision. And I'm gonna actually linger with this one a little bit. And we're gonna observe this behavior. I need to say that blind racers are very active snakes and they will readily try to scare you away from wherever they are. Sometimes they would also rattle with their head. Actually, maybe in a little bit, I don't want to harass that too much. I may, if we have time, I may show you some videos of good explanation of how visual snakes behave. I just don't want to do it right now. All right, here we have a few more American cayubits. So as you can see, I keep them pretty moist. And you know, it's, it's actually interesting. You know, wild snakes uh, often drink rainwater and they drink dew, which is there on the grass and different subject uh, objects every morning. So, I have no problems keeping, keeping them wet as long as I am periodically letting a free and open it and let it air dry a little. So, this is actually a glaze rat snake. It's a subspecies currently considered of the eastern rat snake. Here in Massachusetts, we have a black version of it. Uh, which is basically, according to today's uh, genetic findings, is basically the same species. So these grow big, they can grow up to seven feet, and the beautiful orange snakes. Let's see. Also highly beautiful. This beautiful red eyes. And I might as well show you another American colibroids, which is a corn snake. This is probably one of the most common species in the hobby, and I love them, they're beautiful. This one specifically is a ultra orchidy, and that's a female and two males, which are beautiful. See how she rattles her tail? Okay. Look at that tail. That's actually a tail rattling, is what many snake species do, especially in the new world, as well as some old world species. And odds are that this, this behavior actually originated before it originated in rattlesnakes. Uh, many people say that they think that, you know, tail rattling is almost like mimicking a rattlesnake. But I, I, I don't think that's the case. It may be actually the other way around. Many snake species were actually shaking their tails and they probably got supported by evolution with rattlesnakes, but rattlesnakes just took it at a different level. Alright. So now let's go and take a look at some Asian cadubrids. We are not less beautiful. Okay. Can you see a snake? It is actually a little vertigo right here. 
Actually, many snakes bury. When you are in a forest walking over leaves, you never know what is sitting down there. This is Thai bamboo rat snake. It's one of currently it's considered subspecies of bamboo rat snakes. This one is from Thailand, and uh, it has very restricted range. They are just beautiful. They look like fire. But they also have an emperor. These snakes actually will also rattle their tails when they're hungry, which I'm not about to shoot. Okay. They are pretty nervous in the first place. Yeah. These guys actually are highly sensitive to temperature changes, and they don't really appreciate the kind of process. Actually, a larger male kind of Angora snake over here somewhere. His name is Oreo. I adopted it in 2018. They will readily bite. That is a beautiful snake. Not really for an inexperienced keeper. You see that? So let's let them go. And I will show you another suspicious of bamboo rat snake. This one is called Jinan bamboo rat snake. Very close relative of those two from southern China. They have these beautiful bands which they pretty with this uh, all their life. So this one is a male. And I'll show you a female which was actually born here uh, three years ago. Oh, not even. Uh, yeah, that's a female which was born here. The same echo of bamboo rat snakes in general, they don't like being in And with that, I have a third species. Of bamboo rat snakes, some subspecies of bamboo rat snakes over here, which is called broadband bamboo rat snake. And this one, let's see her, she's hiding there now. All right, I, I have another one to show. Let's see this one. Look at this one. So these guys are from more southern part of uh, Indonesia. So Indonesia, southern Thailand. So they are the living mountainous regions out there. And they're probably the reddest ones out of all this uh, subspecies of red, red bamboo rats. They're also highly visual, so you can see. I was moving my hand a bit kind of curious, and it's flickering its tongue and trying to see what it is, whether it's something hidden or not. You don't know it behind the glass. Uh, now, as the next step, let's take a look at some pretty interesting species for, of, again, hybrids from Africa. So, keep stuff around. Some space. You can see it's again buried. And this one is Gans Tegner from Acetopis Gansi. These snakes eat exclusively eggs. And what I like about them, they're actually one of few species which uses very different form of communication. And I will let it demonstrate this. Do you hear how much sound it produces by this? So many snakes, they actually is using their lungs and bodies. And hissing, it means deep 
inhalation and deep exhalation. Deep ex uh, exhalation. Uh, which is okay in an environment where it's not too dry. But these snakes, they live in drier environments of Africa. And uh, at least partially, at least they may have evolved there. And as another group, so scaled lifers, they actually produce this sound by just rubbing their own tails and uh, their own scales towards each other. And uh, ah, you saw that? <laughs> that was impressive, wasn't it? So they actually do not breathe while they do this, and they do not inhale and exhale air, air, and do not lose any humidity. Well, but it's a cold is not. They also this way mimic uh soft scale wipers, which are higher than uh, but egg eaters, they don't even have normal teeth. So even if you eat in the meat, they wouldn't even breathe. Now these are not. So let me do. To show you a picture of the So, do you see that little thing? Over here, this is actually a full grown adult crowned heavy almost snake. Okay, so I have this. So. Now, this is also African species, known from Africa, Arabia and portions of southwestern Asia. Uh, they feed on lizards. And these guys, despite their little size, are loud hissers. You can see how. I don't know if you hear that. Not this. Too much adrenaline is going on over here. That's what it is. So it actually displays now a little bit of intimidation. Of course, it's not going to bite. So it's mostly like shut off. I close this cage. It's just said than done. So I actually I tried to find this one. So it at some point today, but I'm not sure. Where is it? Someone is here. Let's take a look at this one. So this is our new addition. It's actually called Moil Snake or African or Arabian Tusk Cobra. Uh, it is from a different family. We haven't seen this before. Before these were considered calibrates, uh, but now this entire group considered one prophet. And this one represents this subfamily of some of you, like sand snakes. These are actually venomous rare fang snakes. And specifically, these ones would eat cobras 
by cooling up. Uh, the fans are pretty deep in their mouth. And in general, you know, this one has pretty uh, contract personality as seen in different, in different species. Uh, I've had it for a week. So, really look forward to learn more about these little guys. Uh, could you please turn back my computer, Kim? All right. So, yeah, so our little excursion is over now. And I'm looking at the time, it's 2.22. You probably already got a little bit tired. It may have been a lot. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask. I got one. Go ahead. <laughs> Could you describe how you feed that file fish since it's aquatic? So I usually just throw about, there are two snakes over there and I throw about 40 fish over there every week and they gradually just hunt them down. It doesn't happen within a single day. It usually may last another two weeks or a week depending on the size of the fish. Do they, it's actually pretty fun watching them doing that. Do they do that behavior where they drift down on top of them and, and grab yes. them? Yeah, that's exactly what I observed over here. And if any interest, I can even show you a video. Any questions are done. Yeah. Yeah, sure. That'd be kind of cool. Yeah. Thanks. You're welcome. Any other questions? No questions? Okay. Then. I'm going to show you two videos just before we say bye, or maybe three, maybe three, three videos. Uh, one, as I promised, with black racers, and another one with, with marine file snakes. I think that will be fair. It will take less than five minutes altogether. So I can share screen now, right? So, uh, so we just were looking at the black racer a little bit earlier. This is actually a different one. And, you know, I usually like uh, to tell people about the idea of strike range. So in general, snakes are only dangerous if you get in that strike range. And what is that strike range? That is actually how far they can reach from some you know, stable position. And the nuance is that they need to keep about two thirds of their body on the ground in order to reach somewhere. And their strike range is about anywhere from less than 30% or to up to 30% at 95% of time, but rarely it can be longer, like 50%. I even seen very tiny juvenile European adder making like 100%. It's very light. You can imagine it's six, seven gram snake. So it could almost like make a jump to its entire uh, length of the body. But the heavier they get, tougher it gets to do that. And in this video, I will actually uh, show how the snake got triggered by touch to actual doing this uh, you know, preemptive strike, what I call. So I actually, uh, you can see it's in posture, it's just staring at my hand, which is not visible in a current view. And then I bring the hand in and the second I touch the snake, it kind of goes back, but it didn't, didn't 
by the glove. Um, let's see if there is any other video. So if you remember, I told you that uh, black racers and many other snakes are visual. And they use vision unlike many boas and pythons, which use uh, heat sensing to actually see their prey. And I'll tell you just a tiny story. So one time I was sitting in my bedroom. I was about 14 years old back then in my parents' house in Armenia. And I just captured a beautiful Asian racer, Hemorophis numifer, a uh, day ago. So I put that snake on my knees and I was just staring at it. By then I knew that if I touch a snake, I may get beaten. Basically the worst offenses you can commit towards it. If you don't touch it, you're not gonna you know, uh, stimulate it that bad. Uh, but that snake came, actually slithered over my chest and grabbed me by my nose. I was puzzled. I've never seen things like that before. Uh, but after thinking about that for a while and doing this sort of experiments, I understood one thing. Let me let it go. So this now in this in this scenario, I am without I am with eyeglasses. So my eyes aren't visible to snake. So I will move my head about 10 times and we'll see how many times he strikes while I do that. You just count how many movements I do with my head and count his strikes. He sees me, he's a kind of nervous, but you don't see any strikes, right? And I'm pretty much within a strike range. I am, this is about three foot snake and I'm within a feet, foot of it. Uh, so now in next video, I'll show you, I did a different thing. I actually approached the same snake without eyeglasses. You see, reaction is very, very different. He's very nervous. The thing is that our eyes, our sight, as any predator sight, would have been last thing they probably saw before getting eaten. So, uh, I guess it's a very deep written instinct to fear direct sight from close distance. And if while they don't see sight, they feel like not very startled and they still can fly. When they see eyes, they feel like they have no time to fly. The only thing they have left is actually fight. Uh, and let's, I didn't mean to, just do that. Um, but I wanted to just quickly go and show you some marine file snake video of marine file snake, hopefully hunting. So you can see it's in aquarium and it's actually uh, surrounded by fish and here it goes up. You can see that very, very deeply forked tongue. Now it takes its snout out to take a breath. And again. And now it goes. It goes, it goes, it goes. It's a kind of overfish if you can imagine. So. I think that this time it actually captured a fish which was pretty close to it. Tank of sea fish is in there. Uh, just gonna swallow it in, within a matter of just a few tens of seconds. Very fast. Here you go. And look at those scales. They are highly sensitive. They, are, they look like little buttons. And each one has a little bump on them, uh, which actually led them to not just secure the fish, but also feel the touch 
of cold, pretty cold, cold-blooded fish uh, during the contact. So I will stop sharing. And I'll close it. And now I think I am back right here. I'd like to thank you for uh, joining us today again. Uh, this was Tigran Tadevosian from Snake Conservation and Applied Research Facility and New England Herpetological Society. I hope to see you when this pandemic passes. So we can explore snakes together in real life, in face-to-face -face situation. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was so cool. Thank you.